Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Pop Culture King Show. It's your weekly geeky dose of pop culture and entertainment here on AM 1690, The Voice of the Arts. And I'm your host, John Waterhouse. Now, our next guest is a fantastic individual, a real pop culture renaissance man. Rick Drazen is a musician, an artist, an actor, a stuntman, a writer, a personal trainer, a former bodybuilder, and retired professional wrestler. That resume must hit the floor, man. I'll tell you what. He worked on the Incredible Hulk TV series with Lou Ferrigno. He was Arnold Schwarzenegger's training partner for several years. He also worked on screen with the likes of Mae West and many others. And he also designed the famous logos for Gold's Gym and World's Gym, but that's just really scratching the surface. He's also a specialist reserve officer with the LA Police Department, and he hosts several internet talk shows, including Rick's Corner and the SmackDown After Show, which reviews WWE's SmackDown television show that's on AfterBuzz TV. He also hosts another internet show, Old School Wrestling, and he has a whole series, a whole roster of books. His autobiography, The Time of My Life, as well as three books about professional wrestling and breaking into different aspects of the business. Please welcome to the Pop Culture King Show, Rick Drazen. Well, that's quite an opening. That was used for a radio show I interviewed on. Um, I probably do one to two radio shows every two weeks, maybe three, and it's really up to them to do the entry. But I, I really liked it, so I thought I'd play it now. Anyway, welcome to Rick's Corner. This is my journey in bodybuilding part two. Um, I kind of left off uh, as I moved to LA and got down to Venice and trained with the guys and what we did and all those kind of fun things that we did. But what I wanted to talk about was bodybuilding itself because not many people make a living at bodybuilding, very few. Arnold and a few guys at the top made some money. The rest of the guys make a few thousand dollars and then it's spent. So a career in bodybuilding is kind of like useless because you're never gonna make a fortune from it and it's not going to do anything for you other than self-gratification. But you can use it in many other ways. If you present yourself properly without being egotistical and saying look how big I am, it opens a lot of doors and if you have the charisma and personality to go with it, other people will gravitate towards you. So landing a job or uh, working in public with people, um, if you look nice and built and well built, people always like people who look like that. But like I say, if you've got to be a nice person, you've got to be humble and you gotta treat them better than you treat yourself. Now, bodybuilding, when I talk about what it did for me, I never had any aspirations of being in the magazines or even coming close to that, and I had no idea that would ever happen. And as I said, my mom was a big supporter, and when I moved to Los Angeles, and I started training with Arnold and those guys and Joe Weider, and he started putting me in the magazines, I thought, wow, here's the things I've been reading all these years, and now I'm one of the guys in these things, and it's like, it's almost surreal. You don't really realize, realize it's you, but it is you. And then, like I said, off of that, I started getting auditions for movies and TV shows, and we did a lot of them back in the 70s and 80s, and I met probably every superstar you can think of, like Cher, for example, I worked with, and, and Jim Henson and the Muppets, and Sammy Davis Jr., and uh, I just can't even remember all of them. But they all became friends, because in the entertainment business, you have a group of people that remain friends, and you see them through their journey as well. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm still getting over this pneumonia. It's not necessarily who you know to get ahead, but who knows you. So if you present yourself properly, people will never forget you. And when something comes around that they want, they want you for, they'll call you. I had a friend of mine I trained uh, for wrestling. He was a film director, and he put me in 12 movies because he liked me, and he let me try different characters, and I things outside my box, like an Arab general, which I've never done. And I had a lot of fun doing it, and I met a lot of other people. And I worked with uh, uh, Ryan Bosworth, one of the football players, and um, we had a fight scene that was kind of fun to do. And met people like Robert Patrick. We had done uh, Zero Tolerance together about 25 years ago. We've been friends ever since. Uh, Luke Perry from 90210, and these are all friends of mine. And I've kept them through the years. And I don't think that if I had never gone into bodybuilding or wrestling, I don't know who I would have met or how my life would have gone. Um, my mom always said, my friend says, you would have made it anyway because you have the personality and, and the uh, charisma to do it. Well, maybe so, but where? Am I going to stay in Bakersfield, my hometown, and, and work at what? They have local TV shows, but that wasn't really for me. So bodybuilding bring me down to L.A., down to Venice, because Venice was the mecca. 
It wasn't at first. Like I said, it was just a few guys training. Arnold came in, Dave Draper, Frank Zane, and those guys, and then once they came in, what happened was Joe Weider started shooting shots down there for his magazine. Now, his magazine's worldwide. It's the, it's the, the heart of Bodybuilding Magazine. So bodybuilders all over the world would read this, and they'd say, wow, look at these guys in Venice. This is where everybody works out. And they didn't realize it was just a small building hole in the wall. You know, like your, your local restaurant that you go to, the little cafe, well, this was like your little local gym. Not a big place, homemade equipment. But it had the charisma, it had the charm that people wanted. And when you'd walk in, you were inspired instantly to train. Somebody was always there, Joe Gold was always there. He had, he had nicknames for everybody, everybody had their own little place. You had your bodybuilding stars, but no one thought of them as stars, they were just guys in the magazine. Regular guys like you and I. And then you had what Joe called his second team of extras, which were, he, had, he had funny names for everybody, which were the background players in the gym. These are the guys that don't compete, these are the guys that don't get in the magazines, but they're all good guys. They all have their own personalities and charm in their own right, and they're fun to be with. And it's just, it's what makes the family the family. The guys, main guys in the magazine, and the other guys supporting them. So we all hung out together. No one was any better than anybody else. There were guys that probably should have competed, never did, they had great bodies, but they didn't care to, it wasn't their thing. Many of these people worked in the movie studios. You ask, how did they make a living? Well, here you've got so many major movie studios and so much work in on the set as, as uh, gaffers and production assistants and, and as electricians and drivers. It was always easy to get a job, and those jobs pay good money. And when you're not working, you collect unemployment, then you get hired again. So a lot of these guys, this is what they did. Some of them had bouncer jobs in the marina um, to carry them over. But for the most part, it was all studio work, and um, this is how they made their living. Now. Bodybuilding um, in movies was limited because back in those days, you either played a tough guy or a bouncer or a dummy in the background. When Arnold started making movies, they started realizing these guys might have brains, so let's give them a little bit of roles. And I did the same thing. I played the uh, you know, like a bouncer and whatever. But then I started getting better jobs, and some guys started getting better jobs as well. Roger Callard, myself, a few guys that really wanted a career. And acting wasn't something that you just decided, uh, I'll give it a try for a year and see how it goes. This is something you have to dedicate your life to, just like you do bodybuilding. So if you dedicate your life to bodybuilding, and this is what you want to do, and this is, this is your, your discipline, then you can apply that to anything in life and be successful. I told somebody the other day, I wish I had a dollar for every rep I did, and I'd be a billionaire today. But the discipline I had going to the gym, even through sickness and bad health, or even through cloudy and rainy days, or cold weather or hot weather, it never stopped me. And I said, if I can do this under those circumstances, then I can do anything, and so can you. So I put it upon myself to be innovative, which luckily I have the ability to do that, and create a job for myself in art, in t-shirts, in design, in writing books, um, and shooting this show. Now I hated math, and I hated English, and I hated history in high school, I hated it. I liked art projects like ceramics and uh, working with clay or making uh, clay heads and weird creatures or, or doodling and doing cartooning. That's where the Gold's Gym came thing, thing came from. But uh, English, math, and history, why will I ever use it? Well, I use it every day now. You use your math for calculating all kinds of things on your cell phone, on the internet, your bank, whatever you do. The time machine on my, my camera and cutting and splicing and, and editing is all numbers. History is what I'm talking about. The history of bodybuilding, the history of pro wrestling. In English, when I write, it has to be politically correct when I write my punctuation, so I learned to be a good writer. Never thought in a million years that would ever happen. But the bodybuilding, because I took such an interest in it, led me into those things and I wanted to be correct about it. So, working out at the gym and then writing articles for Joe Weider, writing articles for other muscle magazines, and began writing articles for bodybuilding.com. Uh, I think doing the Gold Zoom logo helped put me on the map and training with Arnold and working out with Joe certainly was a plus because people recognized me for that and what I did and then it carried itself on its own. So um, I, I tried to find things that worked for me to self-promote. Now, you, it's not ego, it's not being look at me, look how wonderful I am, but if you have a product and you are the product, which I am the product, I have to promote myself because if I don't do it, no one's gonna know it. The same goes with you. If you are a product or you are a trainer or you are somebody in nutrition, in health and supplements, you have to promote yourself. You have to let people know where you are so they can come to you. 
and you have to present yourself in such a way physically that you look good with your product. And this is how it works for bodybuilding. So if you want to be something, this is how you attack it. This is what you do. After doing those things with the shirts, which I still do today, I have them in China, I have them all over the place, I still get royalties from bodybuilding.com with all the logos, um, it's created an income for me for a long period of time. This show has sponsors, which I'm wonderful, uh, I'm so thankful to have, but I also have my books on here about bodybuilding and certain things and pro wrestling and how to wrestle and how, how to go to a school and how to train, and those books sell over and over their downloads, but they do very well. Then I started drawing the Joel Gold's Gym logo, the little ball-headed guy, because I have the rights to it. I can autograph it, sign it, and, and send it out to somebody. It's on my website for $75. You can frame it and put it on the wall. There was another income. So as you see, it works like that. Now with wrestling, in my backyard, I have a 16-foot wrestling ring, and I train people for movies. I did the cold case for a month. I've done other things like the History Channel, and, and, um, and NBC comes out uh, for documentaries. I had Maria Menounos from Channel 4. She's the one that uh, is a reporter. She, gosh, she interviews the president, Oprah, everybody else, and she trained for SummerSlam and also uh, WrestleMania. So she trained with me, and she owns a company called AfterBuzz TV. So when she came over and she saw the fact that I was doing Rick's Corner, she said, gee, would you like to host a show for me? Now here's another thing I got off of something else. So I did a year and a half doing um, Friday Night Smackdown reviews with a co-host and two guests every week on a Sunday for about a year and a half until I said, I just don't want to give up my Sundays anymore. From that came another show, Actor Z, Actors Entertainment, was over in Hollywood. She saw my show, she brought me in as a guest, and she said, how would you like to host? I said, I would love it. So every week I would go there and I'd get people like in the music business, producers, directors, writers, actors, you name it, I had them. One of the ladies I had was Frida Payne, who was big back in the 70s or 60s with the song called Band of Gold. And she's in her 70s now, I believe, still beautiful. She came on the show and I said, you know, I had a crush on you in high school. Really? I said, yeah, you know, you and I about behind the gymnasium. She said, oh, don't tell anybody. And I never thought in a million years I'd ever meet her, but here she is. I'm interviewing her. And I had a lot of people like that on these shows. So there was another one. Off of that, I got another show over in PowerMe.tv in Hollywood called Rick Drazen Live. And they built me this beautiful set. And then I went on and I started interviewing celebrities as well, and bodybuilders and fitness people and cooks and dietitians and you name it, I did it for quite a long time. I bounced another show off that called Tough and Tender with my girlfriend, Ina Tuller, and she was my co-host and we talked about relationships because back in the day um, when I was, well, training and running around, women would come up to me in the gym and say, Rick, I need to confide in you. For some reason, I have this honest face that they want to confide. My boyfriend did this and I don't understand why. Can you explain to me why he's doing what he's doing? And I had good logic behind it and I said, yes, I can. And I started giving advice and I had gone to uh, marriage counseling for a while and the therapist said, why don't you come in as my intern? People seem to gravitate towards you and ask you for advice. You'd be good at it. I said, no, no, no I don't want to do that for a living. I don't want to do it. But as far as a, a website called Tough and Tender, I had it for a long time. Then I had the show Tough and Tender, which was the same thing. I didn't always relate it to bodybuilding. Arnold does that with a lot of stuff, he relates to bodybuilding, but I just related to men and women uh, in relationships, and then men and women who work out together and have better relationships, and that show took off and did very, very well. So after about a year and a half on all these shows I was hosting, I thought, no, I need to center in on one, and I got centered in on Rick's Corner. Rick's Corner started about nine years ago outside my backyard. I was interviewing young guys that were wrestling in my ring, showing them how to cut promos, and then I took him into the garage and I put a green screen in the banner and I started interviewing him there. Then I got Robert Patrick and Luke Perry and Roger Lodge and all these people to come on and talk to me. And someone said, why don't you call it Rick's Corner? And I said, well, that's a great idea. So when I quit um, after Buzz, Maria and her boyfriend and her dad came over and built me a set, a really nice set with a background and this thing hanging behind me and all that. And uh, I thought, this is really nice of them. So I built the show more and more and more, and then when my daughter moved out of this house, I built a studio in my house where I am now, and when I want to cut a, a promo or a video or a guest, they come right in here with me. When I'm done, I go right into my office and I do all my editing. This is something I taught myself to do. I said, if I have the discipline to bodybuild, I have the discipline to teach myself how to edit on my computer, how to put a show together, how to put music since I play guitar and a musician. I can bring music in, or my son can write me music because that's what he does, and I put the whole piece together. So this is how my life and my journey has been. I still make it a point every morning to go to the gym, whether I want to or not, and most of the time I do want to. Even through this pneumonia phase I had, I took a few days off, and then I went back and worked very light, 
And today I'm probably 99% healed up from that stuff. A little cough left over, that's about it. But this is my journey and this is where it took me. And this is what I'm working on now. Now I have new ideas to maybe do a podcast that maybe just is an audio and put it on iTunes of this show. Uh, I would love to get on cable TV, which I'm pushing towards. Old School Labs is sponsoring me, so we're going to do our own thing together with a new studio, which I have outside my garage. I have another music studio out there where I'm going to incorporate, make a video studio out of it. But like I said, it still gets back to bodybuilding. My workout comes first every morning without fail. And once I get my workout done, I'm good to the day to do whatever I want to do. If I wait till the end of the day, I might not feel like going to the gym. We all get that way. We get tired and lazy. But um, this is my journey, and this is where I am today, and I'm going to carry it through as long as I can. At 72, I'm still young. They said the 70 is the new 50s, which I totally believe, unless you don't take care of yourself and you're an old man at 70, which I see a lot of, only because they never exercise and they never eat properly, and that's their whole downfall right there. I see it all the time. My doctors, when I'm walking around, somebody joining the gym for the first time in their life at 65 years old, they're out of shape, they look like they're going to die. I feel so sorry for them. I try to guide them the best I can, but it's extremely hard for someone to get into bodybuilding, not even bodybuilding, even to get into weightlifting or training in a gym at an older age because they're just not mentally geared for it. But once they get in the routine, I see people make progress, but they have to really talk to themselves. Well, this is where my journey ended up, right here today, sitting right here. And I'm thrilled to death to be here. I'm thrilled to death to have an audience like you. And I'm thrilled to death to share my knowledge and experience because this will go on forever and ever and ever. And um, I haven't forgotten anything through the years. My memory is pretty amazing. I remember every detail of everything I've ever done. And I want to get this out here before I forget. <laughs> so thank you for watching Rick's Corner. Thank you for watching my journey into bodybuilding part one and two. And if you have any suggestions for anything else you'd like, please let me know. Until then, I'll see you next time. Drayson.com. He is the equalizer, baby. See you next time.